Most people who walk a gravel bar after flood season miss the single most diagnostic trait of diamond rough, adamantine luster. It's not about brightness. It's about a piercing, oily, sharp reflection that stands out even when the stone is dusty or partly buried. In the right light, even a pebble the size of a corn kernel can flash with a brilliance no quartz ever achieves. But most searchers look for shape or clarity, not luster, and walk right past it. The ordinary stones dominating floodplain deposits, granite, quartzite, flint, present matte, or vitreous finishes that scatter light more diffusely. Diamonds, by contrast, reflect light in narrow, intense bands, especially on natural crystal faces. Octahedral or dodecahedral habits are ideal, but even irregular rough will flash if you angle it just right. The missed opportunity lies in not training the eye to hunt that flash. Once you spot it, you start seeing candidates where others see gravel. The practical test here is nothing fancy. In the field under direct light sun or flashlight, drag a water-wet candidate across your palm or black card. A real diamond will flash with white-blue reflections and refuse to go dull, even when partly muddy. In contrast, quartz, which makes up the majority of glitters in most gravel beds, quickly loses shine when the water film dries. That moment drying time separates hope from hype. Many valuable roughs under two carats have been dismissed simply because their natural coatings or irregular shape made them ugly. But this is the zone of greatest misjudgment. Real diamond rough can be greasy looking, pale brown or cloudy, yet still worth thousands depending on clarity zones within. Collectors and buyers know that outward appearance often masks internal quality. That's why luster isn't just the first indicator, it's the one that gets a second look. Even more surprising, many of these luster-bearing stones are not embedded in bedrock, but lie loose in recent alluvial deposits, sometimes sitting atop sand. Why? Because diamond, with a specific gravity around 3.52, tends to sink during water sorting, but post-flood lag deposits can reverse that if lighter material is flushed away. A particularly rich find in central Brazil was traced to a lag zone no more than 20 cm deep, where heavier stones collected in a concave channel lip, a feature visible only in low-angle morning light. The takeaway, you're not looking for clarity or shape. You're training yourself to spot a specific kind of shine that resists dullness even when wet, even when dirty. And once you see it once, you'll never unsee it. But luster alone doesn't guarantee value or even authenticity. The next challenge is knowing when that brilliant flash is just quartz pretending to be more. Many novice finders mistake sparkle for substance. The difference between the flash of a quartz crystal and the adamantine gleam of diamond is subtle, but decisive once understood. The problem is, field conditions are rarely perfect. Mud, glare, and wet surfaces can temporarily elevate ordinary materials to mimic the optics of something far more valuable. Without a trained eye or quick test logic, hundreds of thousands of promising stones are misjudged every year, both wrongly kept and wrongly discarded. Start with surface quality. Diamond reflects light with what's called adamantine luster, the highest luster class found in minerals. It is sharper and more piercing than the vitreous shine of quartz or glass. When you rotate a diamond under direct light, its reflections shift in tight, bright streaks, not broad gleams. Even small roughs will show this edge if they have any exposed crystal face. Quartz, despite being abundant in similar river settings, reflects more diffusely and loses its shine faster when dry. Next comes translucency. Most diamonds found in nature are not perfectly clear, but they let some light through, often in a milky or cloudy manner. Lookalikes like white topaz or quartz can do the same but with less internal scattering. Diamond tends to glow from within under diffuse lighting, especially if backlit. One practical field method is to place a candidate over a small flashlight or phone light. Diamond disperses the light in a tighter, more silvery halo. Quartz and topaz typically look cleaner but less brilliant. Shape offers another clue, though it's far from conclusive. Natural diamond rough often forms in octahedra two pyramids base to base, sometimes with rounded or pitted edges due to transport. Dodecahedral or cube-like habits also occur. Quartz crystals can appear similar, especially when broken or partly rounded in a river environment. But quartz rarely forms perfect octahedra, and its fracture patterns, conchoidal with curved ripples, are different. A hand lens ten times will often show these subtle breaks. Color complicates matters. Many field diamonds are not colorless. Pale yellows, browns, and even greens are common and can look like glass or fluorite. Brown zircon, in particular, is a frequent confusion point due to its high density and similar luster. However, zircon often has more internal flaws and can show doubling under magnification, a trait diamond does not exhibit. In low-angle light, zircon's reflections often include reddish tones, 
diamond stays neutral to blue-white. The weight test can help separate contenders. Diamond has a specific gravity around 3.52, heavier than quartz tilde 2, 65, but lighter than zircon tilde 4, 6. In hand, even a 1 carat difference becomes noticeable with experience. For beginners, this means comparing the suspected stone to a known quartz piece of similar size. If it feels oddly heavy but not as dense as metal or lead glass, it could be worth deeper testing. But by far the most deceptive mimic in this space is glass, both natural like tektites and artificial. Some weathered glass takes on a rounded, frosty surface that mimics diamond's irregular skin, yet under loop inspection the difference becomes stark. Glass shows bubbles, swirl patterns, or curved fracture lines, none of which occur in natural diamond. Also, glass fractures with sharp, dangerous edges. Diamond may chip but rarely shatters in the same way. Ultimately, distinguishing real diamond rough from imitations begins with a layering of clues. Luster, weight, translucency, habit, and fracture. No single trait is definitive, but together they form a field logic that makes quick elimination possible, saving time, effort, and money. Of course, all these clues assume you're looking in the right place to begin with, and that's where terrain logic becomes the next deciding factor. The most promising diamonds in nature aren't found where people expect. They don't glitter atop gravel bars like gold flakes in a sluice. Instead, they ride the hidden contours of water flow, tucked into low-pressure zones shaped by the physics of sediment transport. Learning where rivers slow just enough to drop their heaviest cargo, without burying it in silt, is key to finding diamond rough that's traveled. Start with the inside bends of meandering rivers. These zones, called point bars, accumulate finer sediment and organics, but just above them, at the transition from riffle to pool, you often find a lag concentrate of heavier materials. That's where garnets, magnetite, and occasionally diamonds lodge. A high-value clue appears in areas where gravel beds narrow, slope subtly upward, or show armored layers of mixed cobble and black sand. These are zones where current velocity drop just enough to deposit heavies, but not long enough to bury them under lighter silt. But the true treasure map lies beneath the visible riverbed, Paleo Channels. These are old river paths now buried under newer sediment or shifted by tectonic changes. In dry regions, Paleo Channels often emerge as subtle depressions or vegetation lines, visible only after heavy rains or during drought. Satellite imagery can assist, but boots on the ground remain essential. If you can find a place where the modern river crosses or runs adjacent to an old channel, the gravel intersection often acts like a trap, catching diamond-bearing material eroded from older deposits upstream. Elevation matters, too. Diamonds are heavier than most river gravel but still move in flood events. After intense rainfall or snowmelt, high-velocity flows carry them farther than usual. As water energy dissipates, diamonds settle into specific zones along the inner arc of a flow path. Look for ridges perpendicular to flow direction, ripple marks in coarse gravel, or zones where organics concentrate. These can signal recent diamond scale drop zones. A little known but highly practical field test is the bate push, using a wide, shallow pan or bate to probe sediment directly along these inner bends. Scoop mixed gravel from just above the point bar and pan gently. You're not looking for color, you're watching for weight retention. If magnetite, ilmenite, or garnet dominate the concentrate, it's worth a closer look. Diamonds may not show in the pan directly, but these heavies share transport characteristics, and their presence raises probability. One documented success in the U.S. came from just such a bend on an Arkansas tributary, where amateur prospectors recovered small diamonds along a 30-meter stretch that revealed a paleo-channel intersection during a rare flood event. None of the stones exceeded one carat, but several were gem-grade and sold for over $2,000 each after certification. What mattered wasn't luck. It was a correct reading of terrain logic under time-sensitive conditions. Another overlooked zone is behind natural obstructions, boulders, tree roots, or bedrock steps that interrupt fast-moving water. These create scour pools or eddies where heavier material can momentarily stall. If these obstructions lie within the channel's main energy flow during floods, they become priority sampling spots. Even 10-15 minutes of bate work around such a feature can yield more clues than hours on an open gravel bar. Still, the presence of heavy material doesn't guarantee diamonds. That's where the first true indicators, like magnetite and ilmenite, start to refine the search. When you sweep a magnet across your concentrate and feel that extra drag, it's a sign the river has done the pre-concentration work for you. 
The trick is knowing how to read those signs and how to follow the trail. In almost every documented placer diamond recovery outside of direct pipe mining, one pattern repeats. Heavy black minerals precede the diamonds. Magnetite and ilmenite, two dense, iron-rich minerals, act as natural trail markers. They respond instantly to a simple field magnet and often concentrate in the same hydraulic zones that diamonds prefer. Ignoring them is like ignoring smoke when you're hunting fire. Magnetite with a specific gravity of around 5.2 is strongly magnetic and appears deep black with a metallic to submetallic luster. Ilmenite is slightly lighter, around 4.7, and weakly magnetic but more common in diamondiferous terrains. While they don't guarantee diamond presence, their abundance in river or terrace gravels often correlates with nearby kimberlite or lamprate erosion. The logic is straightforward. If these dense, erosion-resistant minerals are present, the river had enough energy to transport them, meaning it could have also moved diamond rough along the same path. The field test couldn't be simpler. A pocket-sized rare earth magnet swept across damp concentrate will collect magnetite immediately. Ilmenite takes more patience. Swirl your concentrate slowly, watching for fine black grains that shift with sluggish drag when the magnet moves near. It's not dramatic, but the weight and weak magnetic pull betray its presence. These grains typically show no sparkle, no color, just a matte or submetallic sheen under sunlight. To speed field decisions, work in microgrids. Collect a small pan sample every 10-15 meters along a promising inner bend or paleo channel lip. After panning to the heavy fraction, dry the concentrate slightly and sweep the magnet. A strong hit of magnetite or ilmenite in multiple adjacent samples builds a pattern. That pattern should anchor your next stage grid sampling or sieving. Because wherever these heavies collect, the odds of finding diamonds increase measurably. But beware the false confidence that can come with black sands. Many terrains, especially those with volcanic or metamorphic activity, yield abundant magnetite without any connection to diamond-bearing pipes. The trick is ratio. If you consistently recover garnet, magnetite, and ilmenite in the same sample set, and especially if the garnet shows pink to purple hues, you may be downstream from a primary or secondary diamond source. One telling example came from central Namibia, where an overlooked alluvial bench showed concentrated ilmenite and small red garnet fragments. No diamonds turned up initially, but three seasons later a deeper dig revealed 14 stones in the 0.5 to 2 carat range, most of them yellowish and of industrial grade, but too suitable for cutting. Those finds later traced back to an eroded lamprate dike 6 kilometers upstream, the black sands gave the first signal, but only systematic mapping revealed the source. Finally, volume matters. If you're recovering only trace grains of magnetite or ilmenite, the likelihood of diamonds is low. But when these minerals cluster thickly, enough to visibly layer your pan bottom, you're in a sediment trap where even the densest minerals had time to fall out of suspension. That's the zone you grid, map, and sample further. Of course, signal minerals alone aren't enough to make the call. Garnet, especially pyrope, brings a new level of diagnostic precision, and its color can say more about diamond potential than any black sand ever could.